Welcome to the Startup Grind. I should be thanking you. It's good thing you're raising money today. It's definitely not that. Um, so, and yeah, the other tradition with Startup Grind is to start right at the beginning um, and ask you where you're from, uh, what your parents did for a living, and what did you want to be growing up? Right at the beginning. Right at the beginning. Um, so, uh, I grew up in a very small town called Murupara, which is um, outside of Rotavegas, about an hour, hour-ish. Anyone heard of it before? Hey, represent, it's a handful. Um, so, born there, moved to um, a place called Papa which is by the Mount, and then went to school in Tauranga, so I spent most of my schooling there. I uh, grew up on a farm, um, which meant a uh, a couple of things. One of the things that meant is that I had to stay behind after school and wait for the school bus. And we had a BBC Micro that the school had, and while I was waiting for the bus, I went to program on that uh, computer. So I decided when I was, I think maybe seven years old, that I wanted to be a computer programmer when I grew up. Um, and in fact, I wrote my the, the best seven lines of code I've ever written uh, during that time period, where it would say, uh, "What is your name?" And then I'd get one of the teachers to put in their name, you know, Mr. Dixon. You are a jerk, Mr. Dixon. <laughs> what is your name? Trent. You are awesome, Trent. What is your name? So, yeah, it sort of all went from there. <laughs> so, how do you put that validation then? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and yeah, okay, so speaking of that, so moving on, we, um, I think one or two people mentioned on the Meetup page, because there was a little spiel about you, about last.co.nz, mm. um, that if anyone visited that page, there was nothing there. Um, and that was a company you founded. Um, what was Last and why did it fail and why is it not there anymore? Um, so Last.co.nz was a straight rip-off of lastminute.com. Does anyone know of lastminute.com? Yeah. Yeah. Probably whatif.com over here is the thing that we're um, that's more familiar. So uh, basically an entrepreneurial friend of mine, someone who I was doing some work with, um, said, hey, I'm thinking about starting up this business and my dad's going to bankroll it. Um, and you could be a technical director and a shareholder and a direct, um, uh, sorry, technical lead, a shareholder and a director. Um, are you up for it? And I was like, sure, it sounds like fun and interesting. And um, so we spent the next kind of 18 months working very, very hard to um, to write all the code to build and, and build this website. And uh, we made some classic mistakes, you know, kind of uh, computer science 101 stuff where we just, the scopes kept creeping and creeping and creeping. Like, hey, why don't we do distressed stock, and why don't we do last minute events, and last minute accommodation, and kind of one thing after another after another. And, and so we never launched. Um, we never got it off the ground, and about 18 months in, um, sort of had had enough, to be honest. 18 and, months. Yeah, it was about 18 months, and kind of 18 months of working every weekend, right? Those of you who are in startup and know what it's like, it's not. And I remember at one point I was in a uh, business kind of incubator, in the, in the railway station at, in Wellington, and I was looking down on all my mates walking to the one day cricket on the concrete concourse towards the Westpac Stadium, and going, is this really worth it? <laughs> uh, no, was the answer. <laughs> but I mean, the good thing is I didn't lose my shirt, right? So it was uh, my first failed startup, um, and lots of lessons learned, but um, didn't come out of it bankrupt at whatever I was, 23, 22. So, first lessons learned, you mentioned, like, what was the, how, how did that experience kind of shape up, like, Obviously, you you stuck at it. So, what was afterwards like? What did you come away from that experience? One of the one of the main things is um, when you start a business, you've got to be involved in everything. So, what I did was I just shut off from the business side of things and went, "Oh no, my mate, he's the entrepreneurial dude, and he knows what's going on, and I'll just let him drive what the product is doing and kind of you know the things that we should build and be working on." So, um, and I just sort of just left that to him when I sort of realised afterwards that when you, again, you're starting a business and there's only a couple of you, you've got to be in everything. Um, you've got to be across it all. So that was definitely one of the lessons that I learned and probably one of the things that sticks with me the most. Um, and then, I mean, it's it's different now. So back then we didn't have our build, measure, learn loops and kind of, you know, that, that thinking wasn't around. So, um, yeah, but spending 18 months writing code that never, you know, ever gets used, it's pretty, pretty depressing. Don't do that. <laughs> Any of you work for 18 months and not... No? Sorry, I thought you put your hand up. Sort of, yeah. sort of, a couple of sorters, yeah. What a waste of human life. <laughs> yeah, I'm totally with you. Yeah, um, I mean you mentioned obviously that was before um, the kind of lean starts up and the, the 
build measure learn loop and stuff like that. Um, how long ago exactly was that? Well, um, that would have been two, 2001, 2002. Sweet, cool. So, I mean, that was quite a way back. Right? And um, obviously, you kind of came out of that then with a few different um, a few different experiences. It didn't completely turn you, you off the idea of owning a business. Where did you go straight after that? Like, did you? Um, so, there was sort of this in between period. So, kind of when last was fading away. Um, um, my mate Jono helped me out with a gig, which was sort of contract programming with Surf Life Saving New Zealand, so that sort of um, got me a little bit of money in. And about that time, that's when we decided to set up Optimal. So um, I was actually hired into the grad program at Unisys in 2000, and met um, a, a friend there called Sam, and we ended up um, flatting together and kind of always talking stuff and nonsense, and this is back in the days when um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad was a thing. Remember that thing? Yes. Um, so we were all, everyone in the flat was reading that book and we are kind of, yeah, we'd talk about it and think about business ideas and um, and then I had a real interest in human-computer interaction um, that was, despite kind of my early years and working with computers, we never had a computer at home, so by the time I got to university I was, you know, I was never going to be the whiz kid programmer that some of the other people were because they'd just been coding since, um, on computers at home since forever. Um, but I found a real niche with this human-computer interaction thing, I loved it, just the psychology and how, how human beings work. You can see movement better out of the side of your eyes and colour better out of the middle. It's fascinating to me. So I sort of really got into that human-computer interaction. So I'm talking through that stuff with my mate Sam, who's got an industrial design background. And of course, you don't design a chair without figuring out how tall the average person is. Um, we kind of thought, well, maybe we could start like a usability company. We could do user testing and that sort of thing, which I've had a tiny bit of experience with at university. So, Because that was quite rare, we like really rare in New Zealand at the time. Yeah, it was, wasn't, um, so there was a handful of university um, usability labs, but there was very little done commercially. Um, so yeah, it was pretty new. I mean, we were, the value proposition was ridiculous. We were a couple of kids in our 20s would go into large organisations and say, why don't you give us a whole pile of cash and we'll tell you how shit your website is. <laughs> <laughs> and we've never done this before. Um, so it's sort of as a unique selling proposition, it's sort of, shouldn't work really, but it was that's what, another piece of advice for those of you who are thinking about um, startups. Just passion just counts for us so much. So when we um, back in the early days, we got um, Victoria University as a client, and uh, that was that was pretty massive. That was a real you know seal of approval, and they really just hired us because they could see they could see the fire in our eyes and knew that would work all day and all night for them. So um, so they hired us to do it, and then you know, things started growing from there. Because it must have been tough as well, like, like we said, it, it wasn't really that well known here, like user experiences now. Um, how did you come about with those first customers? Like, obviously the passion and the drive, but where did you find them? How did you know that, that oh, we need to speak to these people? Um, so we, we did everything we could to kind of educate the, the market, I guess. So every possible speaking gig we went after, we tried to list every possible association, the, library kind of lunchtime meet up, you know, they didn't have meetups back then either. Man, I'm sounding old. Um, so we, uh, and in fact, New Zealand Computer Society, we did a talk for them in Wellington, which was which was kind of a, you know, this size group, so that was a pretty big deal for us back then. So we worked pretty hard at educating the market, I guess. We would um, try and talk to journalists, we would, um, we were all doing it all ourselves. We didn't have any, we didn't know what we were doing really, we kind of figured that's how you went to these kind of events, we did everything. In fact, we would we would we would talk with anyone who would meet with us. To we would do stupid stuff like show them our business plan and kind of. Um, I remember approaching Air New Zealand way way too early, and he was like, oh, "I'm doing this for as a favour," and you know, you're so cute. Um, and then you know, it wasn't for a few years later until we got Air New Zealand as a client. Um, but yeah, we just just went after everything. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and I mean, in terms of you said like educating industry, and, and did you? Who kind of bankrolled it? Did you guys bootstrap the idea yourself pretty much? Like, we'll, we'll fund this ourselves and see how far we can take it? And, um, and what was the what was the kind of vision that you wanted out of it? Like, where did you see it going? Uh, so, if, if you saw it going. Yeah, no, we did. We were quite ambitious back then. So, um, we, we bootstrapped it ourselves. So, um, Sam, because he's crazy, um, pretty much got married, got a mortgage, and, um, and started a business all at the same time. So, his wife bankrolled him. Um, as for me, that surf life-saving gig, um, I think I got paid $11,000 for the contracting work and I just lived like a student again, turning noodles and 
um, and that kind of thing. So, and we would pay each other sort of every now and again, little kind of dribs and drabs of can we take a thousand dollars out kind of kind of thing. Um, and then when we hired our first employee and we put her on a salary, and I think it was something like forty five thousand um, dollars, we were like, she's getting a salary. Like, shouldn't we get a salary? Uh, and that was the first time that we paid ourselves was um, was when we hired an employee, which by the way was the most freaky thing we've ever done. It's one thing to kind of you know be running a company, you and a mate, and you might drive it to the ground and it's your own livelihood. Um, it's a completely different thing when you're hiring someone else and it's, it's their life that you're playing with. Was, that was a very felt like risky and freaky and scary thing to do. Um, so that's the first uh, uh, part of your question. The second part is the way we had a vision. We did write a business plan. We left it probably about a year, which was probably quite a good thing. Uh, it was um, this beautiful um, sort of 90 page piece of creative writing. You were, it was awesome. Um, but there was one little table in it, which was like, you know, optimal in, you know, five years time, 10 years time, I can't remember what the time frames were. And it was, we were like brainstorming there, right? Like we'll have, we'll have three offices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then we looked back on it and like we did a lot of that stuff and kind of, um, you know, ended up going into Australia, ended up sending out, spinning out a product company and kind of, we, it's not like we kept that as our guiding light and something that we refer to every day, but it's sort of weird what happens when you write down a vision of a set of goals and you kind of, you must get there by default in some ways. So, so probably about, like, for anyone that doesn't know the, the kind of optimal um, story, so to pull him back to, you, you hired a few employees, that was when it got serious, it felt like it was, it was kind of um, more than just you two. Uh, when was it that you actually decided, okay, we can push this and open up a second office? Um, yeah, so we made $30,000, $36,000 in year one and made $350,000 in year two, and it kind of just went from there, so it was pretty, pretty quick snowballing. Um, in 2005, I was um, bored with my flat and bored of Wellington, and that's when we decided to set up an office in Auckland. So it's like, and I encourage you guys to do this. Like sometimes it's not about kind of pure business decisions. Sometimes it's about like, where do you want to go in life and what's, you know, follow your nose. And so the funny thing is we set up here with a, a few big clients. We had um, BNZ, Auckland University, and uh, maybe it was Vodafone um, or Extra. And and we thought, well, it's going to be easy. You know, I thought it was going to be easy. I've got mates up here, or kind of, um, we were sort of connected in with the incubator network, so we kind of ended up moving into um, Ice House for a little bit. Um, 12, fast forward 12 months, and we had those same three or four clients. We doubled revenue with those clients, so that was great, off a small base. Um, but it's not like we'd kind of, you know, we were starting from scratch, we had to do all these networking things and kind of, you know, start again in some senses. So we didn't move to Auckland with necessarily a particularly strategic, I was bored. Is that a, is that a strategic reason? <laughs> We were kind of like that with some of the other things that we did. So we love travel, Sam and I, um, and so we would we would go to overseas conferences, and that that ended up um, that ended up just holding us in awesome stead when we ended up spinning out our product company because people knew us and trusted us, and maybe those guys do know what they're talking about. There's some seats down the front if you want some seats for the people. Who... Yeah, there is a few if you want. Yeah. I know that the front row is kind of almost feels off limits to some people. Right? But... More than welcome to not for you guys. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So I mean, like, so some of the product, you mentioned some of the guys you were working with. Like, what were some of the really interesting products you worked with? What were some of the the really like some of the cool stuff you did? And then what was the, the stuff that really overachieved? And, and you know, where you thought, okay, we're on to there's a process here, and then we're really on to it. Or was it quite bespoke all the way through? Um, no, I think that the the art of user testing for those who have done it. Who's done user testing? Right, because I didn't really tell you what Optimal did. Maybe I should start there. Basically, we're a user experience consultancy company. We started out with most of our work being observational research, so watching people interact with technology and figuring out what's confusing and annoying and frustrating and making recommendations to fix it. So our deliverables weren't code or designs, they were reports. Um, and then we moved very quickly into design, but more interaction design rather than the visual design stuff. Um, and that's kind of the main things we did when we kind of grew up a strategy practice as well. Um, so the really cool stuff for me was when we um, when we moved beyond um, kind of websites and mobile and apps and kind of when you went overseas and kind of you know, went to these conferences like I guess when you work in England or you work in you know, Germany or the States you kind of end up being quite niche and that's all you do is the website usability testing and we were just going broader and broader and broader and we ended up doing 
you know, various forms of research on um, robots, on uh, in-flight um, entertainment systems, on in-car navigation, on um, all sorts of just cool stuff. And then we started moving into service design, so we worked with ACC to help reduce falls in homes. We um, did some work for victims of sexual violence. That's that's like that is I get goosebumps thinking about it now. Like that's really impactful stuff, really important stuff that we were working on. So that's the stuff I think I'm most proud of is when we kind of just applied that same kind of curiosity and empathy towards a you know a human and applied it in different contexts. I just found that thoroughly fun and interesting and, and endlessly fascinating because uh, we're moving from industry to industry to industry. Probably actually one of our one of our highlight projects, I guess, was the two years we spent helping in New Zealand design this kind of couch. Um, so that was in a hangar, uh, sorry, a hangar a warehouse not too far from here, where they had a mocked up Boeing fuselage and kind of um, we worked with them to whittle down five designs to one. Um, that, was, that was cool. That did, was they, kind of, did they approach you about that or did you approach them? They approached us, so we'd done some bits and pieces of work and uh, in fact a lot of the initial work had been done by IDEO out of the States. They had the best gig ever, so they were basically brought to New Zealand. Um, I won't tell you how much year New Zealand spent on them, but it was a lot. Um, and they were like, well, you need to understand service in New Zealand. So the first thing we need you to do is to go to Hooker Lodge. And then we're going to need you to experience some bungee jumping and the best dinners, you know, the best restaurants in the country. Like, what? Um, so that was that was their gig. And they kind of did this, this kind of envisioning video uh, as a result of that. And then uh, in New Zealand got some industrial designers. They came up with 19 different designs. They whittled them down to five. By this time, idea was, wasn't working so closely with them anymore. And they were like, mm, now what do we do? We've got these five designs. And that's when they approached us and said, we know you've never done anything like this before, but we figure that you'll be able to figure it out. So um, yeah, they approached us. So like, I mean, even three or so years ago, I met Chris and Gareth, who, who worked at Optimal Life in Auckland. Um, and it still kind of felt, coming from the UK, where I recruited for user experience people in Shoreditch, which was like you could go as niche as you wanted to. There was such a market for it there. And then coming here, um, and like one of the first things I did was, was search for a user experience specialist recruitment agency. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't I don't think I found one that knew what user experience was apart from Raspberry that I then started working for at the time. But even that <laughs> took some explaining to what it was. Um, and googled it, and, and Chris and Gareth and Optimal were by far the only ones that kind of really felt like knew definitely what the approach was in London and, and, and then it kind of caught up a little bit here. It must have been really tough for you guys, especially for a, a consultancy, a, like a, a um, services business, like a consultancy business right, to, to graft, to, to almost educate the clients as you're winning the business, like saying, oh, well you can actually apply design thinking to more than Right, and then getting the sky catch gear and stuff like that. Um, you make it sound a lot more strategic than it was, though. Yeah. <laughs> so so I always wondered if it actually was, or whether you guys, you mentioned like looking at overseas stuff and yeah, bringing that back, true. or. Yeah, I guess there were some, you know, we looked at things like service design and we actually know that's what we should be doing. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's probably fair that we were somewhat strategic. But, you know, we had ACC approach us and went, so we're thinking of doing this thing with falls and homes, and we want to run this uh, ideation and innovation program, and can you help? And it's not like we approached them and said, yeah, we know what we're doing there. It was a lot of, you know, clients dragging us in that direction, which is um, quite a, I guess, cool way to kind of build your business is having clients drag you. I'm not kicking and screaming, but certainly, you know, to kind of get that early demand. The other thing which is kind of the benefit of educating the market is you become synonymous with that market. So in the early days, it was all about optimal and kind of everywhere you looked when you looked, you know, and that was great for recruitment too. We'd have people like Michael Dutton go, um, you know, who, who's doing UX in New Zealand? Like, you don't have to look under, under too many rocks before you find optimal. So while it was certainly hard work at the beginning, it, I think it really paid off. It kind of, yeah, like I said, made our name synonymous with that industry, which was, which was, which was pretty useful in lots of different ways. I went to recruit for, by the way, because there wasn't the user experience designer that I knew that hadn't already heard about Optimal and hadn't already <laughs> applied for a job. Like, it, literally everyone, I don't think anyone hadn't applied that I'd met. Oh yeah, I applied to them direct. It like, makes my job tough. But, uh, yeah, well, time, yeah. Um, okay, cool. So, for, like I said, for anyone that didn't know the story, Optimal, it got to four offices you had? Or? Uh, three. Oh, three, oh, offices. three and a half. Three and One half. person in Canberra does not an office make. <laughs> All right, three and a half offices, um, and then you kind of lived the startup dream of starting a business and then it being acquired by 
a big, huge corporate, which was PwC. Um, how did that come about? Was that something that you, did you position yourself for acquisition at some point, or did you, it just came up? Or? Yeah, so, um, the, so the, the sort of three owners of Optimal, so Sam you heard about, and um, Salish is the other person. Um, so by sort of, oh, I guess 2012-ish, um, two of them had left the day-to-day -day working of the business, and I was on my way out. I was sort of feeling a little bit tired, and you know, I wanted to do something new. Um, so we wrote a strategic plan, it must have been 2011 or something, we were like, five years from now we will sell in 2016. And up till that point, I sort of had over-engineered parts of the business, so we had things like Salesforce and Harvest to record our time, and um, you know, we were using Xero very early on, and lots of that sort of stuff, which meant we had a lot of systems in place, um, which is actually, if you're looking to um, you know, get acquired, that's something I can thoroughly recommend, is that you do all that stuff as early as possible. Um, so anyway, we were sort of looking in that direction, and then what happened was, um, I have to be careful because this is being recorded, isn't it? Um, <laughs> we were approached, um, I'll, I'll tell you the full story. We, um, so, we uh, heard about Deloitte Digital potentially starting up in, in New Zealand, and so we went along to meet with them to try and scare them off. Um, and we said things like, You'll, it'll take you five years to build your brand, you won't be able to find the people. So at the end of that conversation, I said, well, maybe we should just buy you. And we said, well, maybe you should. <laughs> <laughs> and then things started getting a little bit serious. They started flying people over from, um, from Australia to meet with us. And at that point, we thought, you know, in the same way that you sell any asset that you've got, if you're selling a house, you know, the more people at the table, the better. So we thought, well, why don't we reach out to people at the other big four um, consultancies and just sort of see if there's any interest. Um, and there was um, from two other parties, so one of those parties was PwC. And then um, we had the joy of running an RFP process. You know, we're so used to as a consultancy being on the other side where we have to put in proposals where we went, okay, here's, we'll give you this information memorandum, here's all the high level details of our business, um, and we need your responses by this date, and any questions you've got, we're gonna send to all the other parties and kind of, so we ran this process and kept it quite tight. We gave them very little time actually um, to respond and it was, by far and away, um, PwC were the best fit uh, for lots of different reasons. So the answer to your question is, um, yes, we were kind of positioned in that direction, but also there's a saying that, you know, what is it, companies don't get um, get sold, they get bought. You know, you have to be, there has to be someone on the other side of that transaction, so you've got to be in the right position at the right time. Um, and that's what happened with us. So you had, you, you mentioned as well you had the product side yes. of it as well. So, so there was a few other sort of spin-offs from Optimal as well. Yeah, and I should be clear that that business is not owned by PwC, that wasn't part of that transaction. So what they bought was the consulting um, side of the business in Australia and New Zealand. Which is now, it was, it was rebranded PwC Digital. That's right. As well, yeah. so, so the other spin-offs were, there was Optimal Workshop. That's right. Um, which was? So that's uh, um, basically software tools for usability geeks. Um, but that's uh, in, in some ways a, a more interesting kind of business, it's 90% um, plus of its revenue is offshore, it's your classic SaaS um, kind of business and, and a, a customer list that's amazing and, um, and, and yeah, so that's sort of a much more classic product startup um, and seven years before we got a profitable, you know, I don't know, but just a hard, hard graft, much easier with a consultancy business with it, you know, dollars per hours, um, yeah, we probably put about $600,000 of our own money in that, um, so just, it's hard if you're doing a product, you should do a product company, you should do a product company. Who's doing a product company? You should do a product company. <laughs> it's gonna be hard. <laughs> so how did it How did it come about, like what was it? Was, was you involved heavily in the start of that? Was it that you identified that there was a... Um, yeah, so in, in 2000, this may be too much detail, I don't know. In 2005, BNZ approached us and said we wanna do some card sorting, uh, We, which is where you kind of sort groups of content and functionality, um, little bits of them into groups, and then you name those groups and you do that lots of time and you get a sense for you know, how people think about classifying information and therefore hopefully you design a site structure that meets that. Um, so they wanted to do this card sorting gig um, and we looked at the tools out there, we wanted to do it online and because we're researchers we wanted the raw data, we didn't want this, um, you know, they called it dendrogram, basically you do this kind of analysis and come out with this pretty picture at the end, we didn't want the pretty picture, we wanted to get it down into Excel. Uh, there was no tools out there that did it, so we thought, um, we asked our mate, uh, Andrew Mayfield, to, um, to, who was with, a, um, with us at Creative HQ, a business incubator in Wellington, to build the tool for us in a weekend. Um, he took a week, you know, classic IT overruns, 
Um, and we rolled it out and two or three thousand people completed this card sort. And we thought, shit, this is actually pretty interesting. This might be something here. Um, and we kept using it for a few years and in 2007 we decided to spin it out as a separate company. And that was partly because Sam was bored. So Sam, who I started the business with, was like, this consulting gig is perhaps not for me. I, you know, I've always wanted to do a product company. Maybe I'll be the boss of that product company. And so because Sam was bored, bored we decided to um, spin out a product company. Good reasons, eh? Good. Yeah, we look like geniuses now. But <laughs> not for the first seven years we didn't look like geniuses. But. I think that's one of the answers that everyone was hoping for, though. No one actually says Okay, that. we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> no one knows what they're doing. <laughs> it's acceptable. It's okay. okay. Um, all right, so you said then, obviously, since then, you've, you've gone on to, um, I think, the gig straight after that, you, you landed with Spark, was that right? Was Bend. 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 So Bend straight after that. Yeah. Um, so what was that like? That you went in as Chief Product Officer? Yeah, so yeah. Chief Product Officer there. So I sort of think of product management as the intersection of three circles. So you've got the business circle, you've got usability, users, marketing circle, and you've got the, um, uh, what's the third one? Tech. Technology. We need to understand technology. So I was like, Tech background with computer science and all the rest of it. I had the business background with running um, you know, CEO of Optimal for a few years, um, and so I had a UX background in spades. So um, went in there, very fast growing, software as a service business. You're probably very familiar with the Ben story here. So I think I was employee number 40 ish. Um, so obviously much bigger than that now. So um, yeah, one of my first jobs was to, um, I guess, corral the tech team. There was, everyone was a little bit of gun shy because of inventory apocalypse, which had happened. Um, three months earlier, so we're doing Agile, but hadn't done a sprint in three months, um, uh, partly because of this issue we had with overriding inventory in a database. <laughs> I mean, it's just a sales system, who cares, but um, so everyone was a little bit freaked out by that. Um, so yeah, sort of gradually um, kind of got us back on the, on the rhythm of sprints and, and um, hired a bunch of people and kind of, yeah, so that was that was, that was was a good time. How did you feel going from, from running the business to then going into a, a product that, that most of the product was existing and it was launched at that point yeah. wasn't it yeah so um so it was already kind of out there what was the um what was your kind of game plan when you got in there was it to, to make your mark on the product or just to just to kind of help it no i think i mean that i started out with um with interviews and i encouraged you who are people who are new into roles i guess it's my consulting background and kind of you know falling back to type but um i just uh, just talk to everyone, it's been an hour, everyone is going to tell me your problems, and in fact I did that before day zero, um, so I was quite deliberate about that, and then on the very first day at nine o'clock in the morning, I got them together and just went, this is what you've told me, and I looked super smart, but I was just regurgitating everything that told me, all the patterns that everyone had said, you know, were the problems with the product, so that's sort of, the very initial game plan was probably pretty obvious, it was just kind of reflecting back what people had told me, so it wasn't um, until I'd been there a little while where I kind of found my feet in terms of what I thought the, the um, priority should be. But it's, I mean, it was, it was a crazy time, um, you know, that's that very fast moving SaaS business. It's like, well, should we set up an office in Toronto? Okay, three weeks later it felt like we had an office in Toronto and kind of, um, so, yeah, that was, plans get thrown out the window pretty quick, move pretty quick. What would you say, like, I mean, there, there's a few people I think here that work for them, like what was the, do you think there was a defining factor that, that got them the success and scaled as quick as they did to become a big global company? Or? It's a great question. Yeah, I don't know what the answer is. I chucked that one out. I didn't send that to you before. I no, come on. I, um, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe some of the other vendors might have some insights into that. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, so I guess I... Um, yeah. Do you want to know? <laughs> it happens in the past. It happens in the past. So I think it's right, right time, right place, kind of, you know, all that sort of stuff. You know, you can do point of sale on an iPad. Um, you know, so... so um, and, and Vaughan's personality and kind of... He was, um, he's very photogenic, he's, um, he's quirky. Um, that's smart, that is super smart. For you guys who want to get on the covers of magazines and stuff like that, do something, be quirky. That'll, that'll tell the story. Or so, um, a moustache. It doesn't no, have to be a moustache, but, but think about it. Yeah. Um, so then you went on from Bend, um, that was Spark afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, currently at Trade Me as well, in case anyone didn't know. So, I mean, they're, they're kind of three big name New Zealand companies after that, um, and it was head of UX at Spark as well, wasn't it? Um, Spark Ventures, which Spark is Ventures, kind of yeah. venturing arm of Spark, so yeah, quite different to Spark, the mothership. Yeah, so quite different um, cultures, and mm -hmm. I'm guessing pace of movement as, as well, yep. judging by what Ben was like. How did you kind of adapt moving into each one, like, 
Was each one like a culture shock every time you go in? Or? No, it didn't feel like a culture shock. I don't know, you just sort of, I don't know, get to know people. I mean, the other thing is I'm biased towards action. I like moving fast, I like change. That gives me energy, so it's sort of, um, in fact, the, the Spark stuff. Although Spark was different in its own way. They had a portfolio of businesses, each at different stages. They had a, a different rhythm and cadence to it, but they were trying to do something different. Uh, in there, so it never felt like I was grinding gears. Um, no, it's always it's always felt like quite a natural transition into each each of those roles. I think what would be really hard would be to go into the public sector or go into a large bank or go into um, you know a, a large corporate. I mean, you know, Venn was small. Spark Ventures was trying to do something different, so it didn't feel like Spark. Um, Trade me five hundred odd people is a really nice size. Um, so it's possibly part of it too. We kind of mentioned as well, you touched on the, the lean um, kind of startup model of the field site from that, like the, the loop, um, and you coming from a tech background, but then having a service design business at one point as well. Where would you see your, in the, in the products and stuff you've worked with, is there more an area you lean towards, or is it like just kind of needs must for each business you work Yeah, with? it depends. I mean, it's always the classic. Usability consultants answer, you know, it depends. So, um, what is it that you're trying to do and achieve at the beginning of, a, of, of, of something, doing that generative kind of uh, ideation type design thinking stuff might be um, perfectly appropriate if you're at, at the start. If you're a long way through, then it's much more about iteration and, and um, you know, sustainable innovation maybe rather than disruptive innovation. So, yeah, it really depends on where you are in the kind of product life cycle. Um, and in terms of like the sort of the products you've worked with when you were optimal, um, and then obviously going in places like them and stuff like that. Is there like a for, for the products for the, for the whether it be SaaS or just businesses in general that have kind of succeeded and ones that have failed out of that? Is there any kind of trends that you've seen? Anything you can say? Oh, okay, that was why those guys succeeded, and oh, okay, that was why these guys failed, or has it just been a real mixed bag all the way through? Um, I think it's been a complete mixed bag, uh, mixed bag and there's no pattern, but I've kind of post-rationalised because I saw that question earlier. <laughs> and I reckon, it's, uh, I reckon it's something to do with learning, like an organisation that's optimised for learning, and that implies a lot of thing, things. It implies um, experimentation, it, it implies a healthy attitude towards failure, that failure is a natural byproduct of innovation. Uh, it implies you know, a fast cycle, it implies an openness and humility to learn. Um, I think that's the key. I've been reflecting more and more about that at, at Trade Me and how we go about doing more A/B testing and and um, I don't know more of these lean experiments and we completely misuse the term MVP. Um, so I'm trying to kind of encourage people to actually learn what it really means. Um, so yeah, I think it's about learning actually. So if you're going to launch a startup or any kind of business right now, let's say. You know, if you left trade me and thought, right, this is I'm gonna get back into it now. First steps, like what what would you do? With, how would you how would you like guessing it's not an idea you've had already or right now or you're gonna push last again or anything like but what would be your first <laughs> steps that you, you took? So is that domain still available, is it? No, I, I actually checked it and there was there's like someone else on there, yeah. Hmm. I thought uh, that might have been the business and then I was gonna say, I might not ask questions on that because I don't think yeah, so maybe anyone does own that. Yeah. Yeah. Sean's still got it. Um, oh, it comes back to that. I think that the the work done in that whole um, that lean startup movement. It's all a bit cliched now. You might think you know everywhere you look, it's kind of the same stuff. But um, I actually think there's something really really important in it. Trying to understand the problem space. Like let's solve real problems. There was a, um, a great talk I listened to recently about designers designing um, you know, mindless Candy Crush type games. Like so let's solve real problems. Um, so I, you know, I encourage you to kind of follow that same. You know, there's heaps written about it. You don't even have to read the book, but you know, that minimum viable experiment, um, minimum viable product idea, and try and just try and understand what the problem is that you're trying to solve. Really, truly, deeply understand it. Um, that would be the first step. So don't don't you be writing any code now. Um, don't be touching the code. But yeah, getting out there and talking to real people and trying to understand what their what their needs are again. Background shining through there, but that sort of seems to make sense to me as a first first step. Well, because design thinking would be more to spend a lot of time with a, a community or a group of people or something and understand and empathise with them. Um, design thinking doesn't have to be a big thing. Um, so we, 
I don't know if people are familiar with the Google um, Design Sprints that they've kind of um, popularized, search for it, they've got a book, it's awesome, it's a playbook, here's what you do on day one, here's what you do on day two. Um, so we did that at Trade Me to redesign our homepage, we spent four days from kind of, you know, ideating and kind of doing the same kind of process, converging, doing some mock-ups, getting users in on day, day four it was. Um, and that's just solid, easy stuff to do, like it's not at all rocket science when you read that book, you're like, yeah, I can do that, I can do that, I can do that. Um, so yeah, I, I encourage you guys to check, check that one out. And that was, for us, that was a little bit freaky. So I was tasked to redesign the Trade Me homepage in four months. That gets 23 million page views a month. Like, don't screw it up now. Um, so yeah, we did that all with design thinking in four days. And you would look at what we did at the end of that fourth day, and you look at what we launched with, and you go, they are very close siblings. They, they, you know, you can see how you've iterated and improved and done all the rest of it. But like, the, the base of the idea was there in four days. So while I was um, like working at, at Trade Me, you know, you've, you've read on the homepage. Depending on how much you can get away with saying, like, is there any anything really cool you're working on right now, or, or can you not answer that at all? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, what can I say? Um, probably not a lot. So we're probably probably a listed company, and um, we've got our half yearly results coming out at the end of February. So um, yeah, this, I have to be pretty careful about what I say. That kind of might give a hint as to the direction that Trade Me's going, but it's. Um, I think it's very, very exciting at the moment, so we've got a bunch of people in there uh, for whatever reason that have got this really fresh energy. I think for a long time Trade Me has underinvested in technology, so that's why you've seen this massive growth in staff numbers over the last couple of years. Um, and so we've, we've sort of got these multi-year catch-up roadmaps of work that we need to do. You know, you kind of look at an Amazon or a Etsy or a, you know, you name it, we're kind of, you know, pretty far behind what an ASOS, you know, uh, e-commerce experience looks like compared to buying something on Trade Me. So we've got a lot of work to do, but the good thing is that we've got the right people and this really wonderful attitude where people just want, just start wanting to change. Let's go, let's go, let's go. There's a real, um, yeah, fire there in our belly. So it's, um, it's a pretty exciting time to be at Trade Me. Cool. And obviously for people in the crowd or other um, working at a startup or thinking of an idea um, or, or might have even launched one that's going really successful, like advice that you would give to someone in the very early stages that's thinking about it that, that maybe you've been given or just from all your experiences that you've learned, what would be the advice that you would be like, like you have to, have to heed this advice? Um, two things. Um, one, find a Sam. So it's, it's really hard to be a solo founder when and that's what Sam and I found. He is, a, he is an upbeat kind of guy, but we found that we really needed each other when we were kind of, you know, doing our second all nighter in a row for Victoria University. They picked it. We did work all night for them, two nights. Um, you know, we, we just needed one another to pick the other one up when we're kind of, you know, the going gets tough. Um, so find a Sam. Um, and the second thing is, is nurture your super optimism bias. So we've all got this kind of built in bias where we think things generally speaking, um, are going to work out well for us. Uh, and entrepreneurs have that have like, a, a, they're almost off the scale in terms of, which of course makes sense, right? So we know the stats of how many businesses fail, and yet we all go out and try and start it, and not me, I'm not going to fail. There's this great stat I read about where they basically interview people coming out of um, marriage kind of offices, you know, just signed up and they got, just got married, and they'd say, do you know what the divorce rate is? And I was like, oh, 40% or 50%, and what's your chance of getting divorced? 0%. And like they did this with hundreds of people, and everyone's like 0%. Um, yeah, so that's the kind of optimism that you need to have, I guess, that, that you should nurture that. You should always, um, you know, go for it, go for it, go for it. That's that, that's that um, persistence that'll get you through. Um, yeah. I think on, on that, then we'll probably open it up to the, to the crowd um, if anyone's got any questions. <laughs> you mentioned before around the definition of an MVP. Give us your six or seven synopsis of MVP and your secret. Well, they should have called it MVE and called it an experiment because that's what it is. So I think other people think of it as a beta release or the first version when they should think about it as throwaway code. Even if they, in fact, code, code only if absolutely necessary. Is that 60 seconds? I don't know. Yeah, so, so don't be fooled that every situation fits a, a minimum viable experiment. See what I'm doing? I'm just going to gradually just plant it in your brains. Um, so a good example at Spark Ventures was Lightbox. 
so you do not launch uh, a, a, a online streaming you know, TV station with you know, a dozen hours of content. You launch with thousands of hours of content, which costs you many millions of dollars. So you cannot follow the same sort of processes. And likewise, there are parts of trade me that you do not MBE. You know, you, you, so, so it depends is the answer. You can't always follow that same process, I think. This is just my opinion, right? I mean, I said there's obviously like with the, as we were talking about like classification of what actually makes an MVP and, and a lot of people seem to have that confused, like an experiment, so it doesn't even need, you, you drop the P out of it, it can just be anything, it could be an Excel spreadsheet, you know, just, just absolutely anything that, that validates that there's a problem. So I should probably repeat the questions actually. So pick them here. Um, so was there was there a pivotal moment when things really started to ramp up? Was there a feeling where it went just boom? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, was, it felt like I mean, probably in the first couple of years where we went, oh, it's this is a business. Like actually, this is going to grow and this is this is a thing. Um, because for the first little while, it wasn't clear that this was a thing and that it would, it would survive. Um, but then it felt very, it felt quite gradual, yeah. And I guess that's part of, you know, when you go, 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 you just don't, you're not looking back, you're not really celebrating the success and perhaps the way that you should. Yeah, I guess what I was going to lean towards, especially with the B2B type kind of business, yeah. a, a lot of that, that Yeah, that's, that's fair, yeah. yeah. Sometimes it does just take like those one or two big clients and then everyone kind of follows yeah, suit. Follow Is that what you meant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Was, the, was there a moment for you guys like that? Or? Yeah, that's fair. Actually, we've got a couple of names, right? So we had uh, Canterbury Clothing Company, we had um, Victoria University, and we had ACC. And when you get kind of that, that kind of combo, it sort of looks credible. Like, ACC, mind you, they must have done their due diligence. They didn't do their due diligence. Quite a good job. And everyone else just sort of, yeah, so there were definitely a few key clients. And one of the things we did with um, Canterbury Clothing Company, so they were one of our earliest, is we went, we're going to do this $8,000 review for you. We're going to only charge you $2,000. And in fact, on the invoice, we went $8,000 minus $6,000 discount, $2,000. <laughs> Made it explicit, right? This is $8,000 worth of value. Should we either go back and do more work with them? They won't expect that it's $2,000 worth of value. Um, and we said, the reason we're giving you this discount is we get to use this report whenever we want. We're going to pimp it everywhere we go. This is the this is our brochure. Um, so, yeah, that's one thing that we did. I saw something the other day that was similar for, like, SaaS businesses is when you have kind of proved that this is where you go, give, like, a few big names for free just so that you can host them, their name yeah, and yeah. their logo on your homepage, and then everyone's like, oh, they're using it. Yeah. So yeah. their play validation seems to go a long way. Yeah, there's, in fact, there's a lot of... Like social psychology it talks about how to, you know, kind of encourage people to buy your stuff. And that's something that's one of them, right? It's the social proof that other other people have done it. That sort of counts for a lot. Wisdom of the crowd, something like that. Um, getting bought by a big corporate, um, what was, I guess, the transition like for the business? And is there anything you would have done differently? Um, so the question was, what was the transition like being bought by a large corporate? And would we have done anything differently? Um, I, so at that point, I wasn't working day to day with Optimal. So I kind of I was a director of the business, but I wasn't. Um, I handed over the reins to a new CEO. Um, so it wasn't on me. So that man at the back has probably got a better insight. You might have to um, corner him later. He's the tall guy in the purple shirt. Um, uh, went through that transition. So, um, but I would say one regret that I had is that we had an opportunity to sell the Australian business to um, to basically do a management buyout. Um, I won't go into the details of that. We didn't. We decided not to do that because we sort of didn't want to spook the horses. We didn't want want that Australian team to feel completely freaked out that you know this maybe they they weren't wanted by PwC Australia and all that sort of stuff. So, but we should have done that. Why do you say that? I um, why do I say that? <laughs> we can we can edit some of this. Let's, let's, let's talk. Let's talk at the break. <laughs> Um, 
So if you have a startup and you're building a product and you don't have a UX expert on board, how would you go about getting the appropriate sort of UX skills around you? So if you've got a startup, you don't have a UX person, how do you get a decent UX copy? So um, there are a lot of patterns out there now. There's certainly a lot of books. There was, there's, a, there's a real grounding there. The other thing I'd encourage you to do is do some usability testing yourself. It is not rocket science. You, what you do is you give someone a task, you sit back, you watch them, you shut up, um, and you write down what they do. And you do that across multiple people, and you look for the patterns of, of things. And Sam Morgan used to do that back in the day with Trade Me. He would he did launch Trade Me Motors, and he would sit down with his wife and say, find a car, and kind of shut up and have these you know five-item bullet point, you know, next day fix this. So it's don't don't overthink this whole UX thing. But yeah, I'd encourage you to, to I mean, copying is dangerous in itself. You know, there are reasons why patterns work in different contexts, but if you don't have um, you know, anything else, don't reinvent, you know, the word login. Don't, you know, <laughs> there, are, there are standard places where search bars go. There are standard ways to do tabs and, you know, yeah. You seem to have a lot of clients, but did you ever work with public sector? If you, if you didn't, what stopped you to do that? Um, so did we ever work with public sector, and if not, why not? Um, about 30 to 40% of our revenue was public sector. Um, so being kind of headquartered in Wellington is sort of an inevitable part of that kind of um, commercial landscape, I guess. So um, yeah, we work for a large percentage of um, you know, pretty much every major New Zealand public sector agency we work with over the, over the course of quite a few years. Did you, um, did you approach them or did they approach you? Oh, it was a real mix. We didn't, um, uh, yeah, it, it depended. Sometimes there were RFPs, sometimes it was kind of, um, we had a very long standing um, relationship with ACC, so they were some of the, the best, most fun people to work with. Interestingly, when we started the business, people warned us against three companies. They were one of the companies we should never work with, and we just had, have always had a ball with them. Um, so, yeah, it really depends on, yeah, but it's, it's, no, it's not that different to corporate. The only thing is that sometimes they have to follow procurement rules, which I have to have kind of stuff. <laughs> so in terms of the differences with the design process and stuff like that, then like there's a real, there's strict guidelines to follow, or were you given free reign? Or oh, I think um, so. We were we were never, and in fact, that was one of the secrets of our success is we would go in and talk to a client and say, "This is what we don't do. We're no good at brand. Don't ask us to do the, you know, really high end visual design, you know, that kind of stuff." Um, so we actually were really comfortable working within brand guidelines and things like that. That was actually our kind of our sweet spot. You know, it was when BNZ came out and said, design is like a credit decisioning engine and it has to be in lotus forms. And that, you know, one of our interaction designers was like, oh yeah, <laughs> how the hell am I going to do that? <laughs> Bring it on, you know, that's the kind of, um, uh, yeah, so we were quite comfortable working with him. Was that the question? Or? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. I mean, it was just, yeah, it's um, the, a, a spin-off question from that as well, just um, obviously you, you working for when you were with Optima, when you're working with these clients, and a lot of the times it was saying, well, sometimes from what I gathered, um, it was saying, hey, you should do it this way, and then sometimes it would never be done that way. Yeah. And, and that kind of frustration that a lot of people would feel working in a, a consultancy or an agency or, a, or that sort of business, um, to then go in and work in on products where you were the one tinkering with it and you were the one making the decisions. How was the transition between that? Is there one you enjoyed more? Or I'm guessing probably where you had to say it. Um, yeah, I think it sort of comes back to empowerment, right? So a sense of control and you know, autonomy, mastery, purpose, that kind of stuff. Um, but don't think that me as Chief Product Officer of Trade Me that I um, you know, tell anyone how a, a drop down list should be or anything like that. So it's, um, that's not, I'm not necessarily getting into the detail of the products either. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah um, you mentioned your the goosebumps effect you had with, with some of those social change yeah. projects. Um, have you got plans, or would you like to do any more of that in the future? Or? Um, me personally? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I yeah, absolutely. Why, you know, let's let's like I said, let's work on the big problems. Any particular areas you're? Um, I'm I'm quite interested in in wealth inequality and I think that um, some of that comes back to, a lot of that comes back to education, that sort of seems to be the seed of it, so I'm just not, I haven't figured out what all that means yet, but it's pretty interesting to me. Anyone else? Cool. I might have missed this because, sorry, I turned it a little bit late, but um, when you set up... Why were you late? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was playing table tennis back in the office. 
That's probably fear, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Wow, I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 Um, so you're sort of doing it in tandem, so we sort of had a, well sort of, we, we it wasn't, the, 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 the slow down and burn up was kind of, the crossover was actually not that long. Um, so our first ever gig was uh, October 2002, um, and we kind of incorporated this company in February 2003, um, but we've been sort of tinkering I guess for a few months before that October. Um, and yeah, for the first yeah, six months of the company, sorry I'm crossing all my timelines. Um, we were sort of working on other bits and pieces. So. Sweet, I think that's good. Um, yeah, awesome. Like, it was a really good talk. So um, we've managed to we've managed to wrap this up like pretty well in terms of timing. Um, so we'll probably have a, a sort of networking session. I'm assuming there's some beers left. I, I can't see, but there is. Awesome. Um, so yeah, feel free to stick around. We do have to be out, as Eva said, uh, around. Uh, Um, thanks a lot to the sponsors as well tonight. So, um, Braintree, um, Garage Project, obviously, uh, Pixel Fusion, as well as a few of guys who um, chucked in for the biz. Uh, the Grid, as ever, for, for hosting us. Um, UDZ and Hot Ventures, as well. Um, I had to say, obviously, UDZ. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, thanks a lot for coming, guys. The next one is already on sale, tickets are on sale. So, um, I was really, really stoked this one managed to sell out. Like I actually, I spoke to Eva maybe a week ago and was like, we should definitely set a goal this year to like sell out an event for 100 tickets. Didn't think it was going to be the first one. <laughs> um, yeah, so thanks a lot for coming.